Folks, well, uh, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, I'm looking forward to certainly what appears to be an intimate discussion uh, between us all. Um, if you guys don't mind as well, we will have uh, some video recordings taking place as well. Um, and hopefully we'll, we will have some uh, question time to field some uh, inquiries from the audience too, if there is anything specific you'd like to ask. We have a, uh, a couple of uh, questions that we'd like to go through uh, with our panelists here, and I'm gonna give them uh, some time so to introduce themselves. Uh, to talk about their roles and, uh, and to share some uh, of their most pressing perspectives on the state of our uh, general state of health here in Bermuda. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over uh, to our first panelist, Dr. Peter Karachi, and uh, sit down, please. What am I supposed to say? Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I, I was a consultant pediatrician here. I practiced for 41 years. I retired last year. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in nutrition, having observed the epidemic of obesity gradually enveloping this island. So maybe we'll cover some details on that. Bodhi. My name is Sarah White. I am a nutritional therapist at Ocean Rock Wellness. So I work under Dr. Peace Talbot. Um, we're a holistic practice, so we focus predominantly on nutrition. Um, and yeah. I am Sinead Salandi, registered dietitian. I work at um, the Premier Health and Wellness Center. Uh, we focus a lot on diabetes management and weight management and encompass other adult um, diseases that require medical nutrition therapy. Um, so I'm not sure, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that uh, everyone in here at least knows the, uh, the scope of, of the gathering that we're in currently. Uh, this is a panel discussion hosted as part of uh, Bermuda is Love's five a day uh, campaign for the month of April promoting the ideas of uh, health, nutrition, and food security here in Bermuda. Um, and we are hoping to engage, uh, as Bermuda's Love does, other interested and active uh, community leaders uh, and knowledgeable persons uh, to hopefully promote and bring some greater uh, degree of education to the island around uh, crucial issues regarding our health and nutrition and general state of uh, food insecurity here. So um, as part of our uh, general outreach and active uh, focus for this month, we were trying to encourage everyone for the month of April to consume at least five servings of fruit and vegetables per day. Uh, and so along that uh, line, because we believe that it is a fundamental cornerstone of what does make up a, a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle, uh, we want to first uh, begin by asking our panelists here, uh, what does good nutrition really mean and how is it important to uh, guarantee a healthy lifestyle? And I'll ask uh, any one of the panelists that I uh, would like to uh, chime in too. Uh, good nutrition. I'll start by addressing the word diet. Um, I think a lot of persons, when they hear the word diet, they hear a specific, um, what I would say, fad diets are more popular than actual diets. And I like to get back to the fundamental definition of a diet it's what you eat habitually. So it can be healthy or it can be unhealthy. And the nutrition itself is how we nourish our body and how we keep our body in good health. So food is linked to good health and maintenance of the body. When we get to all ourselves, it's made up of protein. So we get protein from food. So when we look at our physical makeup and what maintains this, that is what is the basis of nutrition maintaining and keeping in good health our physical makeup from the crown of our heads all the way to our feet. Um, so that is why it's important if we want to exist daily in a healthy way, um, food is one of the of that, one of it, I should say. Uh, enunciate as well, so we can uh, hopefully pick up the audience. Also. The elephant in the room is obesity. That's what we're really talking about. Um, it, it's euphemistic to talk about healthy diets, but what we're really talking about is obesity, of which we've got an epidemic in this island, and an epidemic in the Western world, and even in third world countries, it's now becoming epidemic as food supplies become uh, <clears throat> more widespread and uh, more. Uh, accessible. What you need to understand is, I'm just going to give you a general spiel about what's, what's behind all this. 
and then we'll get back to the nutrition thing. <clears throat> what we're dealing with is our evolutionary biology. We evolved as hunters and gatherers three million years ago. Um, Lucy in Ovibi Gorge in Africa. Anyway, they were hunters and gatherers. So what it meant was to stay alive, you burned an enormous number of calories every day just to stay alive. And when you're chasing down some antelope that you've wounded, hopefully you get to it before one of the big cats gets to it and takes it away from you. But regardless of that, you were constantly having to move and fight for your existence. That burned a lot of calories. As a result, in mammalian biology, and of course mammals appeared on the scene 60 million years ago, our, our, our mammalian ancestors <coughs> and cousins <coughs> evolved uh, a metabolism uh, to try to guarantee survival. And what that really revolves around is the caloric content of the various foods that you eat. Fat has nine calories per gram. Carbohydrates and proteins only have four calories per gram. As a result, our evolutionary biology saw to it that we store fat, because that is the one thing that's gonna enable us to survive when we are starving. And because it has, it, and because its caloric density is almost is more than twice that of, of carbohydrate and proteins, it was selected out very rapidly. And this is the problem we face. We no longer burn the calories that nature expected us to do. Consequently, the fat doesn't get burned. Another evolutionary device was striate muscle, voluntary muscle. This thing. Striate muscle at rest and when you're asleep burns fat. It doesn't burn carbohydrates. It burns fat. Another evolutionary device, more efficient. So fat, it, everything revolves around fat and your caloric output on a daily basis. We are also programmed to like the taste of fat. There's nothing better than some marbled meat sizzling on the grill or a McDonald's hamburger or Kentucky Fried Chicken, all of which should be banned. <laughs> However, that ain't going to happen. So that's what we're faced with. We're also faced with the fact that about 100 years ago, no, 120 years ago, when the internal combustion engine became widely available, all of a sudden we reduced our caloric output on a daily basis because a machine could move us around. If you look at photographs of Bermuda crowds in the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s and early 60s, you rarely see anybody who was, who was fat, particularly people who were in Bermuda before the motor car was, was introduced. And when I was growing up here, until the age of 16, we all rode our bikes to school every day. Pedal bikes, not motor bikes. So at Warwick Academy, which is where I went to school, there were 300 bicycles in the bicycle shed every day. In those days, it was safe to ride your pedal bike on the road. Now, I wouldn't let my, any of my children, if, if they were young enough, I wouldn't let any of my children ride a pedal bike on the roads today. It, 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 would, it would be a death sentence. So what we're faced with is our, our lifestyle has removed all the necessity to burn calories. And that's why we have an epidemic of obesity. And that is why it's going to be so hard to counteract it. Now, I'm not playing devil's advocate here. I'm just saying it's going to be a really difficult job. It requires an enormous amount of willpower. Why? Because when you are trying to diet, your brain is screaming, feed me, feed me. You're producing hormones which go to the brain and say, eat. And unless you can overcome that, it's almost impossible. One of the advantages of vigorous exercise, though, it suppresses appetite. So, but. Again, it, it then requires that people have the willpower to go to a gym or simply not eat. All right, I've said enough. <laughs> Thank you for saying so all the same. <laughs> Any further thoughts you want to share about it? I would add on to that, that it is willpower and it is a, you know, a calorie and a burn thing, but then we also go into the grocery stores and we grow up, we have no idea how to eat, right? The education right now, we go into a grocery store, we think it's perfectly normal to go down any aisle, pick out whatever you want. So not only are we not burning the calories, we've got no knowledge of, of what to eat, and, and that's a generational thing as well. 
think we're doing uh, pretty okay without the microphone, to be honest. But, uh, but <laughs> can we all be heard uh, okay at the back? We're okay there. All right. Well, uh, progressing on uh, to the next two, if, if I may. Um, if we're if we're looking at what would make up an ideal healthy uh, balanced diet, what kind of uh, uh, proportions of various food groups would you all find uh, to be preferable? I would say the food pyramid we learn, you know, originally says eight to eleven servings of starches, and and we've got one that I use at Ocean Rock, but it's something that um, about five to seven servings of vegetables. That's kind of that's that's kind of a goal. On top of that, would maybe fruit, um, lower sugar options, and then it's getting enough protein in, animal and plant based. There's benefits to both animal protein. Um, it's better to better absorbed. Plant protein comes with lots of fiber, it helps you feel fuller. And then you've got healthy fats. Um, and then hydration would be actually, I would say more hyd hydration if we're looking at servings, we want more hydration. So hydration, then vegetables, fruits and proteins, um, maybe some starches, because in Bermuda we do grow starches very well. Potatoes, pumpkin, um, papaya, bananas, grapefruits, those sorts of things. Uh, so that's kind of natural for our diets. And then last, healthy Same note, uh, progresses pretty, uh, pretty well into the ne next line of questioning. Um, diets affecting us individually. Um, how do our individual diets play out uh, in terms of our overall life outcomes, the quality of life that we can, uh, we can expect? How, how big a role does, does our daily intake and our daily activity level play um, in determining our health outcomes throughout our lives? Let me address that. It's, it's a fairly subtle point. Article was published last week out of Sweden showing that type 1 diabetes may be directly associated with the kind of bacteria that are in your gut. This is an astounding finding. It may have something to do with the bacteria cell wall having a protein that the immune system sees as foreign and it shares it with the islet cells in the pancreas and therefore it, 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 the islet cells get attacked as an innocent bystander. But beside that point, what affects the microbiome in your gut has a profound effect on general health. And so what you eat affects the microbiome. Um, I guess this, and this now moves in back into your field. Diet and microbiome. Diet and microbiome. Diet absolutely. Affects the microbiome. Yeah. And so, for anyone, the microbiome. What is that? That is the kind of colony of, or the community of, you know, bacteria, even parasites, yeast. All kind of we can think of them like bugs that live in our large intestine. So we've got different microbiomes. We've got an oral, a skin, but the one we refer to mostly through nutrition and health is our gut microbiome. Uh, the bacteria, sometimes we take, you'll know, you'll take probiotics. Those are healthy bacteria. But a lot of us have not healthy bacteria. So we can have, you know, we can test for these things. There's, a, you know, Bermuda, you can do that. Um, you can do it at Ocean Rock Wellness. 
but gut testing to see, do you have enough of the good bacteria? Do you have not enough of the good bacteria? Do you have you know, pathogenic bacteria? Those sorts of things. And that too, right, that is where it starts to get tailored because it could give you a risk of something. Um, how do you feed your, your gut? It's really a, a plant-rich diet, lots of fiber, low in sugars, low in low fried foods. One of the research in the UK gives us a number. If you have 20, or sorry, 30 different types of plant species each week, that's a really good way to know you're getting enough fiber and diversity of plant nutrients. So that would be counting 30 different items. It could be a spice, herb, a vegetable, a fruit, maybe a legume, something like that. But that diversity also really helps. So fiber, plant foods, and diversity of foods is really important for gut health. Now can I throw something else in here? You mentioned fruit. Yeah. Fruit evolved along with us, actually. It was around long before mammals came along. But wild fruit is largely fiber and water and a little bit of fructose. The fruit that you eat today is mostly fructose, very little fiber, and some water. That affects the microbiome. You have to think back to what we were expect, supposed to eat from an evolutionary point of view, as opposed to what we are now eating on a regular basis. That, therefore, will influence the microbiome, which throws everything out of kilter. Yeah. And to add to that, um, microbiome, it's these colonies in itself, but effectively what we want it to do is to absorb nutrients from the food to take it to the rest of the body, to deliver it to the rest of the body. So if you have something that is keeping stuff in it, it's going to damage it. We're breaking it down. Exactly. And then if the nutrients are not getting delivered to your cell, then the places that really need it, there's a breakdown there, which is why Things could be wrong in the gut, but how it manifests in the body is inflammation. If you get pains in the hand, if you, in your joints, um, you see your organs being affected, your hair, your skin, your nails, your eyes. So it's the focus has been on the outside so long, and now we're really focusing on where the problem originated because what is needed, the nutrient delivery that all these bacteria and such help to move from the gut into your blood, into your cells, that is where the compromise is now, and that's why it's such a hot topic, the microbiome, the gut. Yeah, a, lot of, a number of autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, are now being associated with, yeah. with the abnormalities of the microbiome. Mm -hmm. Remember, these bugs aren't invading the body, it's probably the immune system which mm -hmm. is reacting to these bugs and then attacking uh, cells in the body which cross-react with the microbiome. Yeah. And probably what we're seeing in Bermuda is a lot of chronic lifestyle disease, so diabetes, things that we can associate our diet and lifestyle, but then there's the other side of it where you're right, you can start to develop autoimmune and things that you wouldn't actually associate with your diet and lifestyle but, but can be because you can have that kind of genetic risk or <coughs> environmental triggers, those sorts of things. And an unpopular statement about um, immunity focus on the primary immune responses and things like macrophages on your white blood cells and such. Um, but the gut is a secondary immune system. Um, and persons would focus on the primary immune system. They go, they do the blood test, white blood cells, what's going on there? And then they don't focus on the gut. So it's good that um, we're having this discussion to focus on um, the next point of immunity. Fundamental. It's important to remember the immune system, besides the lymphatics that you see when they get swollen when you're sick or something like that, the gut, literally from the mouth all the way down to the anus, is completely surrounded by the immune system. There are, there are, there are, uh, there are, it is enveloped by the immune system. So there's a dialogue going on between what's going on in the gut and how the immune system is reacting to that. And secondarily, the body gets affected. With that in mind, with uh, in environmental factors uh, and all associated with that, what can, if we're localizing our issue to Bermuda particularly, um, what can a healthy diet really look for us here uh, or look like us for us where we have a relatively insecure food situation, uh, where we import a great deal of our, uh, our, our food, where we produce relatively little of our own uh, food here? 
and how do you think that uh, directly correlates towards our health outcomes as a population and a community here? Uh, I would say in terms of, it, it's a challenge. I, I would say it's a challenge because food is also a personal something. It's a cultural something. Some persons don't like tomato. <clears throat> I could, we could say have vegetables, have broccoli, have carrots, have squash, um, because we want that fiber day. We want the vegetables that can be locally grown. Um, we have the vegetables that are imported here. Um, but then someone just doesn't like half of the vegetables that we <laughs> place to them. So what does it look like? Um, it still encompasses your vegetables, even the ones that you like, focus on the ones that you like. Um, fruit, and when we talk about vegetables, just to backtrack, it's good to have vegetables probably at lunch and dinner time. That's where vegetables traditionally come into the diet in Bermuda. Sometimes persons incorporate vegetables when for breakfast in the form of smoothies at times. Um, so it is a point of what is good for persons because you can do vegetables in the morning that is not in a smoothie to increase the fiber content of your meal. Um, but some persons will tell you, I didn't end up eating vegetables for breakfast, so I'm not going to do it. So what it looks like in Bermuda um, for ease and mesh in the culture, vegetables at lunch, vegetables at dinner, um, fruit intake. Um, based on chatting with hundreds of persons and you know advising them on what to eat, fruit comes as a snack. Fruit comes in in the morning. Sometimes it's more acceptable for persons to do fruit in the morning. Um, some persons have fruit juices, but there we have to dive in a little bit in terms of what fruit juices are healthy, what are not healthy. And this is just bringing up some of the real life scenarios and real life discussions that I have with persons on a daily basis about their diet. Um, in terms of protein, we talk about plant-based a lot and persons have a hesitation with plant-based because sometimes they believe, do I cut meat out and I like the taste of meat? They grew up eating meat. So we need to discuss <coughs> as it relates to their health, how much meat is appropriate, the types of meat, how it is prepared. So meat traditionally comes in breakfast, lunch, and dinner, because you have eggs at breakfast time, that's normal. Um, you have chicken, you have fish, um, other seafoods as well. You have beef, um, lamb, and then you have the cross cultures of foods that come in as well that are sold in restaurants. Um, it's just what happens. So we do want the vegetables, we want the fruit, um, we want protein, your meats, and we also want healthy fats. And talking about healthy fats, uh, based on my discussions and observations, olive oil is quite a popular one. You have things like avocado oils, you have nuts and seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds <coughs> coming in. Um, but what I like to discuss with persons is what did you grow up seeing? Because sometimes oil sneaks in in all different forms in terms of how we prepare meals. For example, um, in Asian culture, white rice is very popular. Boil it to eat it. In Bermuda, you have different flavors of rice. You have yellow rice, you have Spanish rice, you have rice and peas. And there's a certain amount of pride attached to this starch in terms of if you give me boiled rice, you can't cook. <laughs> <laughs> if you can't make that rice taste good and make a yellow rice or Spanish rice or rice and peas, then can you cook? Mm -hmm. So, what does a healthy diet look like in Bermuda? there is the fundamentals of, yeah, let's do it lean and clean, grain, grains, just boil your vegetables, your fruit, your meat, but we have to go into what is culturally available because food sustainability includes what is culturally acceptable as well. So when we talk about culturally acceptable foods, we can go into portion control um, and we can talk about probably more festive times so persons don't have these foods every single week. Um, so it, it's a nice discussion, but the basics, vegetables, lunch and dinner, fruit as snacks and then fruit as vegetables, your meat, how it is prepared, probably roasted and baked and boiled rather than fried and smothered in butters and breading and such, they taste good. <laughs> 
Um, but in terms of sustainability, it's not just sustainability as in, do you have food to eat? But it's sustainability in, do we have a healthy population in 50 years? Do you have people that are healthy enough to work and to build and to hold up the infrastructure of a country? So, you know, yeah, Let's <laughs> talk about micronutrients. Mm -hmm. Dark colored vegetables have large amounts of what are called antioxidants. Antioxidants are very important. Let's just talk about some evolutionary biology again. Approximately a billion years ago, photosynthesis appeared on the planet. And for all life forms at that time, this was a disaster because oxygen is toxic. Oxygen oxidizes, and therefore DNA is susceptible to being oxidized. And when you oxidize DNA, you now mess up the code, and you start getting things like cancer. So um, we have a whole system in our bodies to detoxify oxygen. <clears throat> Life would be almost impossible on this planet if it wasn't for the nitrogen High oxygen would kill us all. Uh, nitrogen dilutes it all. So 20% is okay. And the geological evidence indicates that at the most, at one point, maybe the oxygen atmosphere was about 30%, and this is when the big dinosaurs lived. And that's probably why they were able to survive. The oxygen tensions were higher, and they could get oxygen you know, into the vast recesses of their bodies, you know, which were 50, 60 tons. I'm digressing. <coughs> Cruciform, is it cruciform, the term cruciform vegetables? Cruciferous. Cruciferous. They are high in antioxidants, right? It's basically to protect your DNA. And when you, and because as I said, if your DNA is not protected, then you get damage to the DNA, and then you get abnormal cellular growth, i.e. cancer. So that's an important part of, of diet as well. I love visuals, and the visual I think of with antioxidants is if you were to cut an apple, it would start to brown. That's right. And because the oxygen oxygen is getting to it. If you were to put lemon juice, which has vitamin C, it wouldn't brown. So you can kind of think of that on a cellular level for almost every cell in our body that Absolutely. we have. Yep. If you're putting the personal stuff. Yeah. And and yeah, nutrients. We've got macronutrients, which is I think where a lot of emphasis is put in in learning, but also in marketing. Low fat, high fat. So we know about fats, carbs, and proteins. Everyone pretty much does. Um, but then we never learn about the micronutrients, <coughs> which are, are all the vitamins and minerals, vitamin C and E, and all those phytonutrients and antioxidants, which are really kind of you can think of them as having superpowers in the body. Um, and they're also kind of the building blocks for kind of cellular health and, and longevity. So when we're thinking of diet and prevention, it really comes down to, I think, more uh, micronutrients than needing a focus on macronutrients. Yeah. These are often cofactors in, in, in enzyme reactions. They, they latch onto a, an enzyme which changes its structure, which changes its function. Mm -hmm. And that's how they work. And the bottom line of that is they speed up chemical reactions. Exactly. speed up on metabolism. Exactly. Many times versus um, exercise is one common way for, and muscle growth is a common way to increase metabolism, but the food side of that is micronutrients. Yeah. As I said earlier, remember, muscle at rest burns fat. It doesn't burn carbohydrates, it burns fat. So it's, well, again, uh, this this brings into the, uh, in, 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 into, into focus the, about basal metabolic rates and body mass index. Um, <clears throat> you all heard of BMI. Well, you know, up to 25 is considered okay. 25 to 30 is obese, and above that, you're morbidly obese. Um, uh, but you could have a bodybuilder who has a BMI of 35 because there's no fat present. It's all muscle. The muscle's denser than fat. So consequently, uh, there, there are arguments against using BMI. There's, lately, people are now talking more about your weight-waist ratio. Your, and that's your, more your heel. Which brings you uh, onto what's called visceral fat, which is unhealthy. And there's what is known as non-alcoholic fatty liver. 
uh, which is a result of obesity. And this causes fibrosis, it causes cirrhosis, um, and also liver cancer. Um, and uh, your waist size is believed to be a more uh, accurate yeah, where you hold your fat. I mean, this isn't my field. But <laughs> yeah, I'm talking nonsense. No, <laughs> no, you're good. The Levesic factory, um, we say the Levane could just look or sound like, ooh, that, that's for people who have a condition. But the Levesic factory oh, that everything. breaks down everything. carbohydrates, protein, fats, alcohol. So if you have a factory in here that's responsible for the breakdown of what you eat and it is covered in fat, I think of it as, as you describe individuals, you have workers and they're doing their job and you come and you put layers and layers of concrete blocks around the building. And the workers are trying to get the product now into the building and they have to go through a loading block. They meet a wall, open a door, loading block, loading block. It's like, when are we gonna get in here? You know, what is going on? So internally, again, we're not getting what they're supposed to get. So. Um, you you can limit your body's efficiency in utilizing the food. So if you eat a lot of food and inside there, the food can't get to it, where's the food gonna go? And then you see the fat coming on, you see the gut being all the bacteria and they're being affected. So it, it's a lovely show that in, in a beautiful <coughs> symphony, everything goes on inside the body and we really need to pay attention Another thing, when it comes to um, body mass index, um, for years it was touted that uh, as you got older, your, uh, your basal metabolic rate gradually dropped, which is why you put on weight. Well, a paper was published in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences last year, huge study, which has completely debunked this. What they have shown is, in the, when you're born, your basal metabolic rate uh, can be up to a, requiring up to 100 calories per kilogram of body weight as an infant. There's a reason for this. Babies have a large surface area to volume ratio. They lose heat very quickly. They're too, and now normally uh, with grown-ups, if, you if you're cold, you start to shiver. Your, your striated muscle begins to vibrate, basically, to produce heat. Babies can't do this. What babies have is brown fat. Now brown fat, as a, there's brown fat and there's white fat. Now white fat is the stuff that gets laid down when you're obese, laid down in your liver, laid down under your skin. Brown fat is basically the equivalent of a car in neutral and you rev the motor. It generates heat. When babies are born, they have a lot, that approximately 5% of their body weight is brown fat. And all this is doing is generating heat because they have a large surface area which is losing heat. This compensates for it. They can't shiver because their muscles are too small and weak. So this is the only means of keeping them, apart from being dressed, of course, but we didn't evolve with clothes. <laughs> this is the point you always have to remember. You always have to think of us as being stark naked. <clears throat> and dealing with that. <laughs> so, so, as a result, this, this paper showed that, um, contrary to thought, the, um, you have this burst of heat production at around the first two years of life. It then precipitously drops. And then, for the next 60 years, your basal metabolic rate is essentially constant. And then it begins to drop. So the argument that you put on weight in your 20s and 30s because my metabolism is showing, slowing down is nonsense. You're putting on weight because you're eating too much. Sorry. I'll back off. Wow. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that, that, yeah, that this was an important paper. Through. It was published two years ago. It was a long paper. I was cross-eyed when I finished reading it. But <laughs> it, it, it debunked. <laughs> It debunked a lot of the old ideas. You've got this burst of heat production at birth, it drops by the age of two, and then it's constant until around 60, 65, and then it begins to drop off. So weight gain between your childhood, your three and your four-year-old, and 60. And you can see, we see obese four-year-olds 
this shouldn't be happening. On that note too, um, now acknowledging that as as we do get older, we do have a change in our metabolisms, but this may be uh, not nearly as severe as, uh, as we previously thought. Exactly. Uh, what now can we do uh, to make better choices throughout our lives, uh, principally uh, to maintain a better metabolism and, uh, and hopefully save off a lot of those adverse health impacts that we've uh, talked about earlier? <laughs> the problem is, attempts to lose weight is uncomfortable. You're miserable because your brain and your body are screaming, feed me, feed me. This is evolutionary biology working. You know, and, you can, and there's no way around it. If you really want to lose weight, you've got to, just, you've got to dig in your heels. You have to work at it, plus a healthy diet. The two have to work together. Are there any other questions? The biggest thing to overcome is human behavior. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is, but I think, what we, I think there's, a, there's other factors which we can distinguish between men and women. Women I'll speak to. Um, you know, we go through different life stages, oh, perimenopause, absolutely. menopause, hormone shifts, all of that. But I think when we talk about like aging conditions and putting on weight and losing muscle, I think what we're not addressing is our lifestyle changes. As we grow up, it often life becomes more stressful. We're a caretaker, we have a full-time job, but we and then we lack the priority towards our nutrition. So that's where like the willpower and things come in. But you know, when high blood pressure comes in, for example, and we say high blood pressure might be an aging thing, we can also look at maybe that person, if we look at their story, their stress has increased, their nutrition has gone down, their sleep has gone down. There are all those factors that play into it too. Um, but yes, then we also start stop exercising as much and those sorts of things. There's something else I've just thought of. Another research paper came out two or three weeks ago. In our striate muscle, voluntary muscle, there are approximately 150 genes that are responsible for its maintenance and function. By the time you reach your 60s, only one third of those genes is still working which is why Arnold has sagged. <laughs> no fault of his own, it's human biology. So consequently, that the, 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 the basal metabolic rate of striate muscle is going to be affected. And another reason why you tend to put on weight as you get older, because your muscles simply aren't doing what they used to do. No fault of your own, this is just, this is just biology. Let's say 150 genes, only one third of those genes are functional when you get to my age. That's why I used to bench press 315 pounds. I have a hard time benching 100 pounds now. Just for you know. <laughs> 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 Any further thoughts, Sarah? Uh, just to add to uh, what Sarah was saying. Uh, when we look at stress management and human behavior, this is where community comes in. And in terms of things that you do now, um, I grew up from zero to six uh, in a extended family home. So if my parents went to work and they were at peace at work, knowing that their child is taken care of by people they trust that grew up, that raised them in a loving environment, a safe environment. Um, now you have, you've moved into more of a nuclear family, single parent family home, um, and you have a lot more daycares now. So even that type of community support, um, prior, I think the industrialization, we spoke about that before, but now it's taken on a different face. Um, corporate looks different, what is expected. Um, you have moms that went from being in the home um, in the 50s, 60s, and then moved in. Now you talk about you know the career woman. So the stress and the demand, um, so the family looks different. So maintaining a healthy diet where it was sit down at dinner, but now there's a certain pride in persons working at seven and working until seven and 8 p.m. where before that was family dinner time. So what is the new cultural norms um, outside of the home where dietary practices originated in the home. So if someone is working to six and seven, what, what time are you gonna cook dinner? You, 
when the child comes home at around 5 p.m. So it's easier to pick something up, take it home, that cuts down on preparation time, cook time. Um, so it is a, a multifaceted approach to how do we keep ourselves healthy going forward in Bermuda, not just the diet and exercise, but we have to have support in the community. We have to have realistic expectations from industry in terms we have to have work family life balance which sounds pretty but it's fundamental people need to sleep they need to eat healthy um, they need to be with their families they need to feel loved they need to feel supported um, and those things would affect your hormones that um, you know doc raised yeah. And we need to have time to cook. I think the best thing, one of the best things I would say you can do for your health is to cook from scratch. But so many of us don't think we have the time or truly don't have the time. And then we rely on any sort of takeout, you know, and we have no idea what those ingredients look like. Um, and then, you know, we, if, if you don't have time to cook for your kids and your kids grow up on certain foods, they aren't going to have the food literacy to then know how to feed themselves through their life. And that's where the generational thing, that's where I think we're starting to see the childhood obesity in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years is the, the generational thing there. What kind of lifestyle changes do you think can, can we uh, look to and have you suggested uh, for people to better orient this uh, work life balance? Can I address that? Lifestyle? As a practicing <laughs> pediatrician, for my entire career, I used to preach to the parents, whatever you do, do not start giving your kids fruit juice to calm them down. If they're thirsty, give them water. Milk when they're babies. If they're thirsty, give them water. And they'll get used to it. This is the problem. This is the whole problem with the guys who are dealing with obesity. It's depressing. And it's depressing because it's hard to do. And most people fail. So then you have even more depression. So it's a vicious cycle. But you know, there's a lot of early learning can go into having a healthy diet. It's what you're given as a kid. When I was growing up, I might have seen one bottle of New Grape once every three months, and that was a major treat. We certainly didn't have any. Uh, we, we certainly didn't have uh, stacks of candy at the checkout counter, in the grocery store, where you got all, where all the impulse buying occurs. You know, when we went to the movies at the Old Island Theater there on Wesley Street. You know, you might get a Mars bar, and that was a major treat. But that only happened maybe once a week. So we've got, we have a profound change in our whole lifestyle going on here. And then you're faced with the problem trying to get rid of all that fat, which the body is grabbing hold of for all it's worth. On that note, too, um, what, what can we do then to better address how we look at access to food and shopping? so people can link the information to practical um, and when we have the discussions more and more about and when I say discussion persons can say well the knowledge is there but the knowledge in your modern time um, the knowledge coming from a professional who's living in this day and age like you probably having similar um, interactions with the environment so still meeting people the 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 computers and such is one aspect of the knowledge base, but linking it to someone who has um, 
studied in it, who's spoken to multiple people, who has a holistic approach, and then meeting with other persons who share your issues and how they've overcome it. Um, I see success with that. Could you repeat the question one more time? It's just, uh, just around uh, access and choices. Access and choices. I think a lot falls on the supermarket because kids go there at lunchtime, after school, things like that. Um, farmers, I think just so much more needs to go into the resources to it. So lots of more farm stands, cooking classes for kids, cooking classes in schools. Um, private and public need to learn the same thing. Everyone needs to get the same level of that kind of food literacy. Um, and it's tricky though. And as, as it is certainly tricky, um, what are, how do we, in your, in your minds, how do we create a Bermuda that facilitates our ability to, uh, to have access to better foods and to a better lifestyle as well? What are the kind of key stumbling blocks that you see? Uh, definitely with access to resources for local farmers too, um, with the deprioritization of uh, such awful food choices even at the checkout counter. Um, what are the other kind of major stumbling blocks that you see? I mean, I think one, I don't know if this is answering the question, but one of the things that I get clients to do is when they go grocery shopping, at the end of their grocery shop, before they check out, look down at your grocery cart. And I would say the majority of clients, the feedback would be that, you know, 10 out of 15 items are packaged and boxed and that sort of thing. Um, so I think it's all around grocery shopping and what's available to us. It's hard to have that willpower and say no when, <clears throat> when you don't know better and, and so many, you know, 90% of the food is, is packaged, imported, everything like that, prime food, sugar, and fat. I have a comment to make here. Um, I would call it stealth. Go ahead. Um, to go back a little bit of history here. In 1962, there was a major hurricane in the Caribbean. It wiped out the sugarcane crop. Completely, completely wiped it out. Some smart chemists in the United States said, let's get some corn syrup, throw some enzymes on it, and up the fructose content. Which is exactly what they did. And depending on how much enzyme you throw into the vat, you can have something that's 50% fructose or 90% fructose, which tastes good. Uh, come back to that point I made about wild fruit that we evolved with. A little bit of fructose, mostly fiber and water. We're now, and of course, selective breeding of our fruit crop has now produced, uh, you know, I said, mostly sugar, a bit of fiber, and a bit of water. Uh, so that, that in and of itself isn't what we were supposed to have been consuming. But the high fructose corn syrup has now pervaded the food chain. So there are half a million products that we consume that have high fructose corn syrup in one way or another. And fructose is not what we were supposed to be consuming. Because at the most, evolutionarily, if you ate some wild fruit, it was a tiny bit of fructose. That's not anymore. And we metabolize fructose differently than we do glucose. And that can lead to fatty liver and more ill health. And to add to the question um, and the issues, um, I think based on what you're saying, that demand and creating something new, um, we have now the word overnutrition. That is not, I think it's not said enough. Nutrition, there's what we eat, there's what we see, and a lot of it is marketing. And no one talks about the marketing industry. No one talks like we have all these products, but it, it, because it's big money industry, um, influence, no one talks about it. And I won't get into the details of that. But when we look at if you're up against marketing and influence in terms of person's diet, then we need to counteract it as well with marketing and influence. Because dietitians on the ground is a relatively new science it's been there for centuries but they were treated in different countries and tribes they were bush doctors and met you know persons who um, alchemists and such but now you have it being more into the um, western world science uh, but we do need to have these simple words that people could digest and understand at home when we used to talk about food security or food insecurity and food sustainability, 
it usually paints a picture of persons of malnutrition, but being underly, not having enough, not having access. We, to be honest, we have had that discussion. There has been things put in place by the World Health Organization, PAHO, um, all these persons to get food to people. As Dr. The food is getting to persons now, now that the consumption, it's over consumption now. So persons also need to put in their mind, am I under consuming? Because you can hear under consuming and we tell persons eat fruit, eat vegetables. They think I'm not getting enough, but they're not, they're not addressing the fact that they're also eating a lot of fat. So if someone does not change when they're eating a lot of carbohydrates, protein, and fat, and they go add to that a lot of fruit and vegetables, now it becomes overnutritious. They have a lot of micronutrients, but they have a lot of macro as well. So we do need to dive in more in terms of marketing to persons. And we do that with the plate, we do it with the pyramid and such, but it does need to come from governmental organizations as well, the conversation, the marketing of healthy foods. We have no billboards of nutritional guidelines in Bermuda. Yeah. Um, you have KFC things on all these bins. I noticed it when I'm on bus, all the bins have KFC ads, right? You have Mr. Chicken has his sign there. What, what do we think influences people to eat on their way home? And when we have more farm stands and these things and you drive, you're like, oh, I should stop there. But then are you gonna pull over? I'm on the bus. So if I see someone selling fruit, I get excited, but my stop is two stops away. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I worked late, so I'm gonna stop there. So we have to talk about marketing to persons. And I've always had that simple passion. Um, where I'm from, Trinidad, we drive down the highway, billboards, billboards of food and food. By the time you get to work, you're like, why do I feel for a biscuit that I don't <laughs> eat that has coconut in it? I don't like coconut. The same way we do that, there needs to be this mass marketing of what is healthy. Because persons always ask questions, what do I eat for breakfast? I'm sure you get that question. Yeah. What do I eat for breakfast? Nobody what do I knows eat? what to eat, but yeah. I don't eat too much. Exactly. Yeah. So the map for the images that they see, when they're on their websites, when they're on Instagram, Facebook, what are the little ads that pop up? Who are the persons paying? Who, who has the big money? And how are we such a smart, evolved mm -hmm. culture, but 20 year olds, 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds, 60 year olds, nobody knows how to eat well, yeah. right? So it does, and I've worked um, at Caribbean Public Health Agency for a short while and sat in the rooms with movers and shakers of um, health and a lot of funding goes into infectious disease, which is, is needed, it is needed, not disputing that. But things like open nutrition on diabetes and those things like, come on, you have one person in the room <laughs> to represent food and nutrition. And all the persons who talk about infectious disease is like 90% of the room. Then I could get in terms of square pegs and wrong holes. I'm a dietitian. With a, what are the, what are persons' backgrounds when they get to governmental levels to talk about food and the understanding of it? So you know, I think just we really and it doesn't mean that someone who is not a dietitian or a nutritionist can't talk about it. The passion needs to be there because hey, this guy could come in and chat. You know, the <laughs> things that I know about any day, any time. But the passion needs to be there the knowledge and we need to market it in a mass way, the same way we're receiving this volume of marketing of unhealthy foods. And Bermuda is beautiful. It's it's a country that's very visual. I mean, your senses are assaulted by the beauty. So if we want to, we want persons to understand it in the way that they grow up and they have this beautiful visual, we could share with them, just like you do in terms of all your posts and, um, the discussions and promotion, it's um, a step in the right direction, but it definitely needs to be on a big Very scale. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of us can add, and, and out here in the audience for the rest of the Upper East Love Evolve folks too, can get involved with that too. Um, are there any other particular significant points as well that you, that are most significant to you that you'd like to reiterate, um, that you said already? Um, as to orchestrating and guiding a better health outcome and nutrition outcome for Bermuda? What are kind of the big glaring 
that's the point of view. Which everyone in Bermuda understood. From my point of view, as a former pediatrician, <clears throat> get them when they're young. <laughs> <laughs> Start teaching them how to eat properly when they're young, and enforce it. That's the other problem. I don't know if parents don't enforce things. They just give up. You know, they don't want to upset the child. You know, <laughs> it's uh, raising kids is tough. <clears throat> One last thing I'll just add is um, we do need to find the fruits, vegetables, five servings, um, the micronutrients are incredibly important and that word is popping up more and more in terms of food sustainability. Um, carbohydrates are important to, for persons to be mindful of because it is linked, the types are linked to what we're seeing in a lot of chronic diseases, um, but don't forget fat. Persons have to be cautious with the types of fat and the amounts of fat coming into their diet. Just as much as carbs, 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 it's, it's that word is just going out there like the bad food. Um, persons do need to pay attention to the type and the amounts of fat because there's still too much fat in the diet. As Doc is saying, um, the fats, uh, we're just not doing enough physical activity to burn the amount that comes into the diet. So even though it tastes good, you still have to be mindful of, is it too much for me? One important point to remember though, a completely fat-free diet is virtually unpalatable. Mm -hmm. And if and you don't want a fat-free diet because you have what are called the essential fatty acids that you need to consume. If you don't consume them, you're gonna get ill. I'm sorry. Um, I would say, you know, Nutrition is more than just nutrition, but when we're presented with such big health problems in a, in a country that suffers from, we have to have difficult conversations and, and get kind of uncomfortable with things. There is absolutely a way to eat really well 80 to 90% of the time and still have those moments of enjoyment with the new grape and the Mars bar and all of that thing. Hagen does ice cream. <laughs> whatever it is. Um, and you can absolutely have that balance, but if you need support getting there, ask for support. You know, if you want to learn something new, you don't learn it yourself, you often go to someone who can support you, and there's tons of resources. Um, you know, there's so many health practices, um, Premier Health, Ocean Rock Wellness, um, you can ask doctors, you can go to a nutritionist, a dietitian, there are lots of resources. Um, in terms of, we we're talking about body compositions, so on April 29th, at Ocean Rock Wellness, Bermuda's Love, we're doing free health assessments for anyone in the community from 10 to 1. So it's a body composition, you can learn your visceral fat, your body fat percentage, all of that thing, those uh, biomarkers, and then we're going to give you some kind of tailored nutrition tips from that. Um, so that's something that's kind of exciting. Thank you very much for your time. We hope uh, everyone at least here in the audience as well uh, will join us in attending that. Um, with the audience in mind too, um, we just wanted to open up and ask if there's anyone in the audience that has any pressing questions or anything that they particularly would like to ask anyone on the panel based on anything that they've heard tonight or any other general health questions too. So this is information that we all love you in resources and, uh, and, and better guides uh, can, we, can we give people access to uh, to help them understand things. Things even like, like the alphabetization uh, example with the apple, uh, Robin, what are the other kind of uh, major things that you would that you would point to to help people understand uh, concepts that don't come from uh, from a level of expertise and knowledge already on it. So I just want to get clear the question you're asking to. It was just like mm -hmm. curious because you talked about the health aspects yeah. and I guess composition can help you help me de stress. Mm -hmm. You don't exactly have the full yeah. thing here, but I'm just adding what what other sort of I guess things could be medicinal or for, for sleep? So it, no. <laughs> so types of foods that will help with stress management yeah, yeah. and overall health. Uh, stress management is, is a bit wide too. Um, a healthy diet, a balanced um, physical activity, feeling um, satisfied in terms of uh, your work, family life, personal life, all these things contribute to how you feel at the end of the day. Um, so there are some, uh, I would say, food items or herbs uh, that you can find, nutrients in food and herbs that can help 
for these things, but no one is a miracle cream. It all works together. So you do have things that help. Um, I certainly don't have all the information. And I think when we study certain civilizations and you see um, they have lower impact of chronic diseases, and they have, I would say, what we call cultural tips and tricks. Um, I guess for me, you would hear things like drink lemongrass tea if you if you feel ill and such. So I think these things sometimes are passed down where the limitations come in terms of what I would know as a health professional being transparent is um, the nutrition knowledge comes from evidence base. So while the evidence is there that this civilization has survived, you know, all typhoons, hurricanes, volcan volcanic, all these things, um, you still have persons that say, well, if you don't do a double blind randomized study, then it ain't, you can't tell it to people in mass production. So when I go to study nutrition, it, we, the book is gonna close in on that chapter because of evidence-based. Evidence-based has its definition in science. So these things do help. It, we've seen, we call it traditional medicine. So that's why we don't, if you will hear this from this person and it will work for you, but you go to the dietitian and it's not gonna be at the forefront of the conversation as well. But it doesn't mean it doesn't help. It's just previously these types of, um, in this type of information was passed down from generation to generation by orating. Um, but, yes, yeah. storytelling. Um, but now you have, uh, we have stipulations when we work in hospitals, when we work <coughs> in organizations, it must be evidence-based because you don't want to um, be liable for a person's life based on telling them, drink something and you have what we call um, upper toxicity level. So if you drink too much chamomile tea, we can tell, and you get ill and you say, well, I went to this place and they tell me drink that and they sue the place. That's really what they're trying to prevent as well. So again, money, going back to money, industry, who are the gatekeepers of information and nutrition information? Um, and where does you know the, the science and those gatekeepers come from? For us in the Western world, I would say. Yeah. 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 So are extremely long listed with words that you can't pronounce. Don't buy it. And <laughs> so we should be pushing this natural foods. Grown in Bermuda, yeah. you know, yeah. live foods are the, what we should be actually be pushing. Grocery store than... tours and those sorts of right. things. Right. Yeah, <laughs> how to read a label and what it means. And, you know, if you pick something up and you start to go through, and we often learn, you know, if the sugar looks high, don't have it. But where is that sugar coming from? So then reading the, the label and things like that. I always say when you grocery shop, follow the outside. Because you walk into any grocery store and it's always like fruits, vegetables, meats, cheeses, eggs, frozen fruits and vegetables, and that kind of thing. When you start to go down the aisle, that's the dangerous part. Yes, question back. I couldn't see. So um, to address your question that you asked, I think another thing that comes into the least of the Unicopsy community is, for what's available for families who wanna learn how to feed themselves, what I do know is you can do like one-to-one -one sessions with a nutritional therapist and a dietitian. Unfortunately, that means you usually, you usually need insurance coverage to be able to access those services. Um, on the uh, like websites, if you like a, a nutritionist's office or a doctor's office, you can ask go to their website, look at their social media, things like that. Um, speaking at for what I know at Ocean Rock Wellness, um, we do a lot of free resources. We do a lot of free talks, online things. Um, but it's hard to be able to offer it that much, but we do do a lot of one-to-ones with families. And if you have insurance coverage, um, you can reach out. Um, we always do uh, complimentary consults as well. And that just allows us to hear your story and put you in the right direction at the least. Um, but you're right, there aren't enough resources. It's, it's tricky because it's, it's a privatized, all the good resources I think are privatized. Um, what would you say to that? Yeah, um, I would agree to that because the thought process from the standpoint um, it's it you do see it more so I I 
experience for me though and the healthcare here and coming from a country where healthcare is free and there's so many community initiatives where you just talk about it you go to the dietitian on a Saturday in your community to plan up for free um, but in Bermuda it's a little bit um, trickier to navigate but I think persons can be clever um, so from the higher um, high insurances all the way down to the ones that we consider no insurances we look at and it, look at it as an investment and this is the practical way I'm talking about not ideal practical it's an investment mom dad goes to the dietitian tells the person nutritional therapist tells them what they need this is what I want I want to know how I can eat I have three children at home I'm a single parent how can I feed them this is my budget for the week guide me and that person would give you the information that you need. You don't need to come back. No. If you want the support, you, want the support yeah. you come back. But you want um, the information from someone that's credible. Um, you go and you, you invest in it there. Think about it like this. Um, you still may treat the family to a meal um, that may come up to 50 something dollars. And the consultation costs Twenty dollars school fees, the insurance. So it's where you place your emphasis, and that that has always been the dilemma with humans. It's there, there and there. But we know if you treat the family, the reasons behind it, stress relief, showing um, bonding and love and such. But preventative care for the family as well has to take priority in the parent's mind. Sometimes it's hard for that thought to even enter someone's mind before something bad happens because it's not a common discussion. Why is it not a common discussion? Because we did these things normally before. We cooked. We, your mom cut up the vegetables. That, you know, we went to the markets. Um, we helped shell peas before. We picked the, the fruits. We went into the family gardens. So there was never the need for us to go outside and get the information. Um, there were not as much fast food places and restaurants. So there wasn't the need. So what you're asking for is, it's great that you brought it up because we do need to say now, hey, our environment has changed drastically. We need to access these resources. And the word has become this, it's also, we put persons in government to manage our resources. So we need to tell them, this is what we need. This is what is happening on the ground. I need you to have more open forum and free discussions about healthy eating in Bermuda, free discussions about what percentage of local foods can I access? What percentage of local foods to imported foods? So the knowledge, um, in Bermuda, persons are very receptive to education and knowledge, very um, intelligent population. So we do need to tell the powers that we raise our voices. This is what we need because the environment has changed. Nanas and papas, are, you know, they're there, yes, but they're going down in age and then you have children who are distracted by social media and TV. So where we just used to sit around the table and chat about it or uh, uh, the highlight of your evening was you're doing homework, but your mom is in the kitchen chopping something. So you now have this secondary visual of how to cook. Because you may find you, your mom was cooking. She, I had a, um, a patient who said she raised her children. They never helped her in the kitchen. Now she has grown boys and they know how to cook. She, she was shocked that they know how to cook, but they used to sit and do their homework on the table right in the kitchen. And it's because they were doing their homework, but they were observing her. Now you have the child that's doing the homework, but then the TV is on, their cell phone is there, the tablet is there, and you bought something to eat. So now you see that visual has disappeared. So we need to, the cooking classes, we need these things now where we didn't need them. So what you said is, um, it's, it's amazing. And it's, it's such a simple point, but it's such a poignant point as well. So thank you for sharing that there's a new need and we need to raise our voices and say this is what we need as a society. Thank you for that response. Are there any further uh, questions? I'd like to just ask if uh, the, the, uh, the panel will 
comment on PFAS and the PFAS. The current problem. <clears throat> well, the current recognition of, of the problems of PFAS in so many of the uh, items that we buy or consume. You stumped me. What's PFAS? <laughs> the um, microparticles. Oh, Micro oh, oh, the plastic. Oh. Yeah. The plastic yeah. microparticles. Yeah. Not good. <laughs> and the thing is, they're eternal. Yeah, this is, this, this, these are substances that the human body was never meant to be exposed to. <clears throat> it, it's not good. We, you know, we're polluting ourselves to death. <clears throat> but, you know, another point, just, just one other point. As I said at the beginning of this session, the elephant in the room really is obesity here. Um, because that's affecting, that has a colossal effect on the cost of medicine. It's gonna bankrupt us at the rate it's going with the number of type two diabetics, the number of people on dialysis. Uh, the system simply is not gonna be able to afford it. <clears throat> but there's something else, the internet. Children sit in front of the internet for hours at a time. When I was growing up, you were outside playing. We didn't have, well, I, I mean, I'm old enough to say there wasn't TV when I was growing up. <laughs> you know, so as soon as day broke, you were outside playing with the mates. <clears throat> and, and, or inventing games, climbing trees, building tree houses, and things like that. <clears throat> now these kids are sitting for hours at a time, and this is also promoting obesity and further bad nutrition, which is compounding everything. So it's a perfect storm in a way. And it's going to require a colossal amount of self-will to get out of it. And most people don't follow that through. I think the future is bleak. <laughs> We're here uh, in, and gathered in this forum to hopefully make it a little less so. Yeah. <laughs> we'll to share some thoughts uh, amongst ourselves and as individuals and how we can uh, devise better community solutions and hopefully uh, create a little bit of a But ideally, forum. this place should have been full. Oh, yeah. And this is information that I think we all need and to this is, And this is a reflection on the priorities. I'm trying to be realistic here. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I thank you for it because it is, it is necessary that you address it as such. Where was it advertised? Because I didn't buy it from a WhatsApp on my second today. I'm like, hmm, hmm. let me see this before. So we do uh, a lot of, of the, uh, the Bermuda's Love advertising um, over social media, unfortunately, because there is so much attention being paid to the internet. Um, something else, again, you bring up a, a, a wonderful point earlier about just the amount of advertising and the amount of money that goes into, again, keeping money flowing where certain interested individuals want it to be. Um, one such thing that I think is, is necessary for us all to uh, be cognizant of um, is where, where net benefits are going in, in terms of where, where we are putting uh, our money and investing in ourselves, investing in our communities, investing in each other. Uh, starts not just with our health, but our health as a microcosm of our family's health, and our family's health as community health, and our community's health as our country's health. Um, and really what we are doing here in, in this evening is investing in ourselves and investing in each other. Um, and where it can be difficult to bring large numbers of people together, this entire Bermuda's Love project really began with Aaron Critchlow getting into the hedgerows and saying, I'm gonna go pick up trash because it's the right thing to do. And because it's there. This when is I, something that all of us need to, when I was to a invest kid, in fully. When I was a better. kid, Barrett used to produce Coca-Cola in glass bottles. Mm -hmm. And people would throw the glass bottles to the side of the road. Mm -hmm. We got threepence a, buy, a bottle if you brought it back. We were out there scouring the countryside <laughs> for these glass bottles. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There are all sorts of ways to incentivize <laughs> people's behavior. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And last question. Yeah, if I, I could just draw just an analogy of a national crisis. Um, three years ago, um, starting in March and April, we were all in lockdown, and we were all living under the threat of a, of a global emergency and something which we just didn't understand at the time and made a lot of silliness. But, uh, 
three years on, 165 people have perished. Uh, well, thank you very much all for attending tonight, and thank you so much to all three of you uh, for, for joining us and for sharing your wisdom. <laughs> just among ourselves, but among our families and the wider community as well. Um, and same thing again, if you guys are open again next Wednesday evening, we will be having another discussion with other uh, local uh, influencers and leaders around the topic of food security here in Bermuda as well. Same place, same time. I uh, hope you will join us. And uh, once again, thank you very much for coming. And a very good evening.